Pramukh Swami Maharaj is the book we're reading. It's about Pramukh Swami and how he was in love, at ease. He comes from a particular spiritual tradition called Swami Narayanism. <laughs> I don't know if that's the technical term. Um, but I believe that, that some of the virtues that he, he embodied are universal. And I'd love, to, I'd love to learn with you all. Swami Sri, which is a term of endearment for him, similarly accepted blame for his sadhus and trustees in front of larger audiences. Swamishri was in London for a spiritual tour in 1980. Hundreds of bhaktas, devotees, were excitedly waiting for him at Epping Forest for a satsang sabha, for uh, an assembly of, of spiritual association and a morning of playful interaction. The late morning rains began to dampen their spirits as they waited for Swamishri. Swamishri and the sadhus were scheduled to be there by 10 in the morning, but the trustees scheduled a few padramanis, uh, visits to householders that morning, which ran late. Swamishri did not arrive at the park until 12.30 p.m. The continuous rains made it difficult to carry on with the outdoor event. The trustees suggested cancelling the event completely. The entire community was devastated at this, as this was their chance to enjoy a few lighter moments with their spiritual master, their guru. The bhaktas started blaming the trustees. I almost misread that. Said started blaming the trees. I'm sure the Lorax would have a few words for that. No, the devotees, they started blaming the trustees. The environment turned ugly, and there was a divisive energy in the air. The bhaktas laughed in disappointment. The next evening, in the satsang sabha, Swamishri asked for the microphone and addressed the audience. I want to apologize for all the trouble that I caused you yesterday. Please forgive me for the inconvenience. I insisted on the Padramanis. The trustees wanted to bring me straight to the Epping Forest. I hope you can forgive me. I will be on time from here on for our satsang programs. The Sabha was in shock to hear their guru apologize in front of the entire audience. By taking on the blame, Swamishri was not only able to bring together the entire community, but also help each faction recognize their mistakes. The trustees learned to become more respectful of the community's time. The community learned to become more flexible with changes. They were both impressed and inspired by their guru's humility. Asking for help can be difficult for a leader. The leader must be willing to be vulnerable and vocal about their needs and do so in a way that is polite but effective. Swamishri knew how and when to ask for help without condescension, condescension or authority. Subhash Bhai Patel of Tanzania had just landed in Accra Ghana, Achra Ghana. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. <laughs> His little Nokia bar phone was an anomaly at the airport terminal. He picked up the incoming call to discover that it was from his guru. Swamishri called him to ask for a help with a Mandir construction project in another country. Subhashbai was thrilled at the opportunity to serve his guru and assist in the making of a Mandir. Swamishri was getting ready to hang up the phone when he added a final thought. Subhashbai, I needed help, and I knew that I could count on you. I am so sorry for troubling you with this request, but I needed to complete the project in a timely manner. I hope I did not trouble you while on your trip. Swamishri then spoke to Kumarbhai Pujara 
and other bhaktas who were traveling with Subhashbhai. Years after the mandir was built and Swamishri left his mortal body, Subhashbhai sat across from me with a cappuccino and recalled the way Swamishri had asked for help. He was calm, polite, and deferential, as if he was apologetic for giving me the opportunity to serve. I was his disciple. He could have just given me an injunction. I would have been delighted. He taught me how to ask for help from my own employees and business partners. Subhashbhai had tears in his eyes every time the story came up, including the last time I shared it with him during the last few months of his life. Swamishri was equally mindful in asking for the help from his own sadhus, monks. As the president and guru of the organization, he could decide how he wanted to dispose of the funds at any given mandir, temple. Swamishri never abused that authority. Swamishri had arrived in Vidyanagar, the educational capital of Gujarat. His mind was focused on the looming effects of the famine in Gujarat. He called Bhagwat Charandas Swami, the local administrator, to the corner of the room after breakfast and asked, Bhagwat Charan, will you give me a loan? I want to help the people of Gujarat. The sadhu was dumbfounded. He rushed outside of the room and called the local accountants to total the accounts and make the funds available for Swamishri to transfer immediately. Later that evening, Bhagwat Chananda Swami approached Swamishri. Please do not ask me like that again. It is embarrassing because you are my guru and I am your disciple. You are the president of the organization. All of this is at your disposal. Swamishri smiled and softly replied, It is all God. We are just caretakers. We are all in it together. Swamishri taught the sadhu invaluable lessons as an administrator and an aspirant on the spiritual path. Nothing is ours. Nothing is permanent. Everything is his. Ask for help, but do so as if you are working on a team as an equal, and not as if there was a hierarchy. Entitlement attached to one's ego can be an impediment to saying two of the most appreciated words. Thank you. To be eyeless is to be cognizant and appreciative of all who have supported and contributed to one's life. Swamishri was a firm believer in thanking those whose support was subtle or likely to go unnoticed. The nurses at Massachusetts General Hospital experienced this firsthand in 1980. The head ophthalmologist insisted that Swamishri get his cataracts removed in Boston. He did not recommend waiting a few months until Swamishri's return to India or for further delay given Swamishri's age and other health complications. Swamishri required an all-male staff to accommodate his vows as a celibate sadhu. The hospital staff and doctors were extremely helpful and, and honored this request. The female nurses on the floor were surprised by this request by an elderly gentleman clad in saffron. Truthfully, it was contrary to what most elderly men requested. This distance raised a curiosity among many of them. They watched Swamishri from a distance and often wondered why he never asked for anything or rang the buzzer to summon a doctor or a male nurse. When it was time to leave the hospital after two days, Swamishri asked the bhaktas, the devotees, to thank all of the doctors and nursing staff. The bhaktas reached out to the male healthcare professionals who had cared for Swamishri, but the guru was not satisfied. He sent a bhakta with a message of gratitude to the female nurses on that floor, the hospital, hospital as well. He even sent small gifts and prasad, which is food that was first offered to the divine, as a token of his appreciation. The lead nurse was stunned. They had not served the spiritual master, so why was he thanking them? 
Swamishri explained to the bhaktas, they were kind enough to accommodate our request. They did not take it personally, nor did they feel offended that I could not accept their professional services because of my vows as a monk. I am grateful for their understanding more than anything else. Swamishri observed and noted all those who were supportive, and his eyeless persona allowed for him to say the two magical words with a smile. And I'm going to pause our reading of In Love at Ease for it there for now and say the two magical words to you as well. Thank you. <laughs>